Chapter twenty one of the Voyage Out by Virginia Wolf. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Thanks to Mr. Flushing's discipline, the right stages of the river were reached at the right hours, and when next morning after breakfast the chairs were again drawn out in a semicircle in the bow, the launch was within a few miles of the native camp, which was the limit of the journey. Mr. Flushing, as he sat down, advised them to keep their eyes fixed on the left bank, where they would soon pass a clearing, and in that clearing was a hut where Mackenzie, the famous explorer, had died of fever some ten years ago, almost within reach of civilization. Mackenzie, he repeated, the man who went farther inland than any one's been yet. Their eyes turned that way obediently. The eyes of Rachel saw nothing. Yellow and green shapes did, it is true, pass before them. But she only knew that one was large and another small. She did not know that they were trees. These directions to look here and there irritated her, as interruptions irritate a person absorbed in thought although she was not thinking of anything. She was annoyed with all that was said, and with the aimless movements of people's bodies, because they seemed to interfere with her and to prevent her from speaking to Terence. Very soon Helen saw her staring moodily at a coil of rope, and making no effort to listen. Mr. Flushing and St. John were engaged in more or less continuous conversation about the future of the country from a political point of view, and the degree to which it had been explored. The others, with their legs stretched out, or chins poised on the hands, gazed in silence. Mrs. Ambrose looked and listened obediently enough, but inwardly she was prey to an uneasy mood not readily to be ascribed to any one cause. Looking on shore as Mr. Flushing bade her, she thought the country very beautiful, but also sultry and alarming. She did not like to feel herself the victim of unclassified emotions, and certainly as the launch slipped on and on in the hot morning sun, she felt herself unreasonably moved. Whether the unfamiliarity of the forest was the cause of it, or something less definite, she could not determine. Her mind left the scene and occupied itself with anxieties for Ridley, for her children, for far-off things such as old age and poverty and death. Hurst, too, was depressed. He had been looking forward to this expedition as to a holiday, for once away from the hotel surely wonderful things would happen, instead of which nothing happened, and here they were as uncomfortable, as restrained, as self-conscious as ever. That, of course, was what came of looking forward to anything. One was always disappointed. He blamed Wilfred Flushing, who was so well-dressed and so formal. He blamed Hewitt and Rachel. Why didn't they talk? He looked at them, sitting silent and self-absorbed, and the sight annoyed him. He supposed that they were engaged, or about to become engaged. But instead of being in the least romantic or exciting, that was as dull as everything else. It annoyed him, too, to think that they were in love. He drew close to Helen and began to tell her how uncomfortable his night had been, lying on the deck, sometimes too hot, sometimes too cold, and the stars so bright that he couldn't get to sleep. He had lain awake all night thinking, and when it was light enough to see, he had written twenty lines of his poem on God, and the awful thing was that he'd practically proved the fact that God did not exist. He did not see that he was teasing her, 
and he went on to wonder what would happen if God did exist. An old gentleman in a beard and a long blue dressing gown, extremely testy and disagreeable as he's bound to be. Can you suggest a rhyme? God, rod, sod, all used. Any others? Although he spoke much as usual, Helen could have seen, had she looked, that he was also impatient and disturbed. But she was not called upon to answer, for Mr. Flushing now exclaimed, There! They looked at the hut on the bank, a desolate place with a large rent in the roof, and the ground round it yellow, scarred with fires and scattered with rusty open tins. Did they find his dead body there? Mrs. Flushing exclaimed, leaning forward in her eagerness to see the spot where the explorer had died. They found his body and his skins and a notebook, her husband replied but the boat had soon carried them on and left the place behind. It was so hot that they scarcely moved, except now and then to change a foot or again to strike a match. Their eyes, concentrated upon the bank, were full of the same green reflections, and their lips were slightly pressed together as though the sights they were passing gave rise to thoughts save that Hurst's lips moved intermittently as half-consciously he sought rhymes for God. Whatever the thoughts of the others, no one said anything for a considerable space. They had grown so accustomed to the wall of trees on either side that they looked up with a start when the light suddenly widened out and the trees came to an end. It almost reminds one of an English park, said Mr. Flushing. Indeed, no change could have been greater. On both banks of the river lay an open lawn-like space, grass-covered and planted, for the gentleness and order of the place suggested human care, with graceful trees on the top of little mounds. As far as they could gaze, this lawn rose and sank with the undulating motion of an old English park. The change of scene naturally suggested a change of position, grateful to most of them. They rose and leant over the rail. It might be Arundel or Windsor, Mr. Flushing continued, if you cut down that bush with the yellow flowers, and by Jove, look! Rows of brown backs paused for a moment and then leapt with emotion as if they were springing over waves out of sight. For a moment no one of them could believe that they had really seen live animals in the open, a herd of wild deer, and the sight aroused a childlike excitement in them, dissipating their gloom. I've never in my life seen anything bigger than a hare. Hurst exclaimed with genuine excitement. What an ass I was not to bring my Kodak! Soon afterwards the launch came gradually to a standstill, and the captain explained to Mr. Flushing that it would be pleasant for the passengers if they now went for a stroll on shore. If they chose to return within an hour, he would take them on to the village. If they chose to walk, it was only a mile or two farther on. He would meet them at the landing place. The matter being settled, they were once more put on shore. The sailors producing raisins and tobacco leant upon the rail and watched the six English, whose coats and dresses looked so strange upon the green, wander off. A joke that was by no means proper set them all laughing, and then they turned round and lay at their ease upon the deck. Directly they landed, Terence and Rachel drew together, slightly in advance of the others. "'Thank God!' Terence exclaimed, drawing a long breath. "'At last we're alone!' 
and if we keep ahead we can talk said rachel nevertheless although their position some yards in advance of the others made it possible for them to say anything they chose they were both silent you love me terence asked at length breaking the silence painfully to speak or to be silent was equally an effort for when they were silent they were keenly conscious of each other's presence and yet words were either too trivial or too large she murmured inarticulately ending and you yes yes he replied but there were so many things to be said and now that they were alone it seemed necessary to bring themselves still more near and to surmount a barrier which had grown up since they had last spoken it was difficult frightening even oddly embarrassing at one moment he was clear-sighted and at the next confused now i'm going to begin at the beginning he said resolutely i'm going to tell you what i ought to have told you before in the first place i've never been in love with other women but i've had other women then i've great faults i'm very lazy i'm moody he persisted in spite of her exclamation you've got to know the worst of me i'm lustful i'm overcome by a sense of futility incompetence i ought never to have asked you to marry me i expect i'm a bit of a snob i'm ambitious oh our faults she cried what do they matter then she demanded am i in love is this being in love are we to marry each other overcome by the charm of her voice and her presence he exclaimed oh you're free rachel to you time will make no difference or marriage or the voices of the others behind them kept floating now farther now nearer and mrs flushing's laugh rose clearly by itself marriage rachel repeated the shouts were renewed behind warning them that they were bearing too far to the left improving their course he continued yes marriage the feeling that they could not be united until she knew all about him made him again endeavour to explain all that's been bad in me the things i've put up with the second best she murmured considered her own life but could not describe how it looked to her now and the loneliness he continued a vision of walking with her through the streets of london came before his eyes we will go for walks together he said the simplicity of the idea relieved them and for the first time they laughed they would have liked had they dared to take each other by the hand but the consciousness of eyes fixed on them from behind had not yet deserted them books people sights mrs nutt greeley hutchinson hewitt murmured with every word the mist which had enveloped them making them seem unreal to each other since the previous afternoon melted a little further and their contact became more and more natural up through the sultry southern landscape they saw the world they knew appear clearer and more vividly than it had ever appeared before as upon that occasion at the hotel when she had sat in the window the world once more arranged itself beneath her gaze very vividly and in its true proportions she glanced curiously at terence from time to time observing his grey coat and his purple tie 
observing the man with whom she was to spend the rest of her life. After one of these glances she murmured, Yes, I'm in love. There's no doubt. I'm in love with you. Nevertheless, they remained uncomfortably apart, drawn so close together, as she spoke, that there seemed no division between them, and the next moment separate and far away again. Feeling this painfully, she exclaimed, it will be a fight. But as she looked at him, she perceived from the shape of his eyes, the lines about his mouth, and other peculiarities, that he pleased her, and she added, Where I want to fight, you have compassion. You're finer than I am. You're much finer. He returned her glance and smiled, perceiving, much as she had done, the very small individual things about her, which made her delightful to him. She was his for ever. This barrier being surmounted, innumerable delights lay before them both. I'm not finer, he answered. I'm only older, lazier, a man, not a woman. A man, she repeated, and a curious sense of possession coming over her. It struck her that she might now touch him. She put out her hand and lightly touched his cheek. His fingers followed where hers had been, and the touch of his hand upon his face brought back the overpowering sense of unreality. This body of his was unreal. The whole world was unreal. What's happened? he began. Why did I ask you to marry me? How did it happen? Did you ask me to marry you? she wondered. They faded far away from each other, and neither of them could remember what had been said. We sat upon the ground, he recollected. We sat upon the ground, she confirmed him. The recollection of sitting upon the ground, such as it was, seemed to unite them again, and they walked on in silence, their minds sometimes working with difficulty and sometimes ceasing to work, their eyes alone perceiving the things round them. Now he would attempt again to tell her his faults and why he loved her and she would describe what she had felt at this time or at that time, and together they would interpret her feeling. So beautiful was the sound of their voices, that by degrees they scarcely listened to the words they framed. Long silences came between their words, which were no longer silences of struggle and confusion, but refreshing silences in which trivial thoughts moved easily. They began to speak naturally of ordinary things, of the flowers and the trees, how they grew there so red like garden flowers at home, and there bent and crooked like the arm of a twisted old man. Very gently and quietly, almost as if it were the blood singing in her veins, or the water of the stream running over stones, Rachel became conscious of a new feeling within her. She wondered for a moment what it was, and then said to herself with a little surprise at recognizing in her own person so famous a thing, This is happiness, I suppose. And aloud to Terence she spoke, This is happiness. On the heels of her words he answered, This is happiness, upon which they guessed that the feeling had sprung in both of them the same time. They began, therefore, to describe how this felt and that felt, how like it was and yet how different, for they were very different. Voices crying behind them, 
never reached through the waters in which they were now sunk. The repetition of Hewitt's name in short dissevered syllables was to them the crack of a dry branch or the laughter of a bird. The grasses and breezes sounding and murmuring all round them, they never noticed that the swishing of the grasses grew louder and louder, and did not cease with the lapse of the breeze. A hand dropped abrupt as iron on Rachel's shoulder. It might have been a bolt from heaven. She fell beneath it, and the grass whipped round her eyes and filled her mouth and ears. Through the waving stems she saw a figure, large and shapeless against the sky. Helen was upon her. Rolled this way and that, now seeing only forests of green, and now the high blue heaven. She was speechless and almost without sense. At last she lay still, all the grasses shaken round her and before her by her panting. Over her loomed two great heads, the heads of a man and woman, of Terence and Helen. Both were flushed, both laughing, and the lips were moving. They came together and kissed in the air above her. Broken fragments of speech came down to her on the ground. She thought she heard them speak of love and then of marriage, raising herself and sitting up. She too realized Helen's soft body and strong and hospitable arms, and happiness swelling and breaking in one vast wave. When this fell away, and the grasses once more lay low, and the sky became horizontal, and the earth rolled out flat on each side, and the trees stood upright. She was the first to perceive a little row of human figures standing patiently in the distance. For the moment she could not remember who they were. Who are they? she asked, and then recollected. Falling into line behind Mr. Flushing, they were careful to leave at least three yards distance between the toe of his boot and the rim of her skirt. He led them across a stretch of green by the river bank, and then through a grove of trees, and bade them remark the signs of human habitation, the blackened grass, the charred tree stumps, and there, through the trees, strange wooden nests, drawn together in an arch where the trees drew apart, the village which was the goal of their journey. Stepping cautiously, they observed the women, who were squatting on the ground in triangular shapes, moving their hands, either plaiting straw or in kneading something in bowls. But when they had looked for a moment undiscovered, they were seen, and Mr. Flushing, advancing into the centre of the clearing, was engaged in talk with a lean, majestic man, whose bones and hollows at once made the shapes of the Englishman's body appear ugly and unnatural. The women took no notice of the strangers, except that their hands paused for a moment and their long, narrow eyes slid round and fixed upon them, with the motionless, inexpressive gaze of those removed from each other far, far beyond the plunge of speech. Their hands moved again, but the stare continued. It followed them as they walked, as they peered into the huts where they could distinguish guns leaning in the corner, and bowls upon the floor and stacks of rushes. In the dusk the solemn eyes of babies regarded them, and old women stared out too. As they sauntered about, the stare followed them, passing over their legs, their bodies, their heads, curiously, not without hostility, 
like the crawl of a winter fly. As she drew apart her shawl and uncovered her breast to the lips of her baby, the eyes of a woman never left their faces, although they moved uneasily under her stare, and finally turned away rather than stand there looking at her any longer. When sweetmeats were offered them, they put out great red hands to take them, and felt themselves treading cumbrously like tight-coated soldiers among these soft, instinctive people. But soon the life of the village took no notice of them. They had become absorbed in it. The women's hands became busy again with the straw. Their eyes dropped. If they moved, it was to fetch something from the hut, or to catch a straying child, or to cross the space with a jar balanced on their heads. If they spoke, it was to cry some harsh, unintelligible cry. Voices rose when a child was beaten and fell again. Voices rose in song, which slid up a little way and down a little way, and settled again upon the same low and melancholy note. Seeking each other, Terence and Rachel drew together under a tree. Peaceful and even beautiful at first, the sight of the women, who had given up looking at them, made them now feel very cold and melancholy. Well, Terence sighed at length, it makes us seem insignificant, doesn't it? Rachel agreed. So it would go on for ever and ever, she said. Those women sitting under the trees, the trees and the river. They turned away and began to walk through the trees, leaning without fear of discovery upon each other's arms. They had not gone far before they began to assure each other once more that they were in love, were happy, were content. But why was it so painful being in love? Why was there so much pain in happiness? The sight of the village indeed affected them all curiously, though all differently. St. John had left the others and was walking slowly down to the river, absorbed in his own thoughts, which were bitter and unhappy, for he felt himself alone, and Helen, standing by herself in the sunny space among the native women, was exposed to presentiments of disaster. The cries of the senseless beasts rang in her ears high and low in the air as they ran from tree-trunk to tree-top. How small the little figures looked wandering through the trees! She became acutely conscious of the little limbs, the thin veins, the delicate flesh of men and women, which breaks so easily and lets the life escape, compared with these great trees and deep waters. A falling branch a foot that slips, and the earth has crushed them, or the water drowned them. Thus thinking, she kept her eyes anxiously fixed upon the lovers, as if by doing so she could protect them from their fate. Turning, she found the flushings by her side. They were talking about the things they had bought, and arguing whether they were really old and whether there were not signs here and there of European influence. Helen was appealed to. She was made to look at a brooch, and then at a pair of earrings. But all the time she blamed them for having come on this expedition, for having ventured too far and exposed themselves. Then she roused herself and tried to talk, but in a few moments she caught herself seeing a picture of a boat upset on the river in England at midday. It was morbid, she knew, to imagine such things, 
Nevertheless, she sought out the figures of the others between the trees, and whenever she saw them she kept her eyes fixed on them, so that she might be able to protect them from disaster. But when the sun went down and the steamer turned and began to steam back towards civilization, again her fears were calmed. In the semi-darkness the chairs on deck and the people sitting in them were angular shapes, the mouth being indicated by a tiny burning spot, and the arm by the same spot moving up or down as the cigar or cigarette was lifted to and from the lips. Words crossed the darkness, but not knowing where they fell, seemed to lack energy and substance. Deep sighs proceeded regularly, although with some attempt at suppression, from the large white mound which represented the person of Mrs. Flushing. The day had been long and very hot, and now that all the colours were blotted out, the cool night air seemed to press soft fingers upon the eyelids, sealing them down. Some philosophical remark directed apparently at St. John Hurst missed its aim, and hung so long suspended in the air, until it was engulfed by a yawn, that it was considered dead, and this gave the signal for stirring of legs and murmurs about sleep. The white mound moved, finally lengthened itself and disappeared, and after a few turns and paces St. John and Mr. Flushing withdrew leaving the three chairs still occupied by three silent bodies. The light which came from a lamp high on the mast, and a sky pale with stars, left them with shapes but without features. But even in this darkness the withdrawal of the others made them feel each other very near, for they were all thinking of the same thing. For some time no one spoke. Then Helen said with a sigh, So you're both very happy? As if washed by the air, her voice sounded more spiritual and softer than usual. Voices at a little distance answered her. Yes. Through the darkness she was looking at them both and trying to distinguish him. What was there for her to say? Rachel had passed beyond her guardianship. A voice might reach her ears, but never again would it carry as far as it had carried twenty-four hours ago. Nevertheless, speech seemed to be due from her before she went to bed. She wished to speak, but she felt strangely old and depressed. Do you realize what you're doing? she demanded. She's young. You're both young. And marriage. Here she ceased. They begged her, however, to continue, with such earnestness in their voices, as if they only craved advice, that she was led to add, Marriage, well, it's not easy. That's what we want to know, they answered, and she guessed that now they were looking at each other. It depends on both of you, she stated. Her face was turned towards Terence, and although he could hardly see her, he believed that her words really covered a genuine desire to know more about him. He raised himself from his semi-recumbent position and proceeded to tell her what she wanted to know. He spoke as lightly as he could in order to take away her depression. I'm twenty-seven, and I've about seven hundred a year, he began. My temper is good on the whole, and health excellent, though Hurst detects a gouty tendency. Well, then, I think I'm very intelligent. 
He paused as if for confirmation. Helen agreed. Though unfortunately rather lazy, I intend to allow Rachel to be a fool if she wants to, and do you find me on the whole satisfactory in other respects? he asked shyly. Yes, I like what I know of you, Helen replied. But then one knows so little. We shall live in London, he continued, and with one voice they suddenly inquired whether she did not think them the happiest people that she had ever known. Hush, she checked them. Mrs. Flushing, remember. She's behind us. Then they fell silent, and Terence and Rachel felt instinctively that their happiness had made her sad, and while they were anxious to go on talking about themselves, they did not like to. We've talked too much about ourselves, Terence said. Tell us. Yes, tell us, Rachel echoed. They were both in the mood to believe that every one was capable of saying something very profound. What can I tell you? Helen reflected, speaking more to herself in a rambling style than as a prophetess delivering a message. She forced herself to speak. After all, though I scold Rachel, I'm not much wiser myself. I'm older, of course. I'm halfway through, and you're just beginning. It's puzzling, sometimes I think disappointing. The great things aren't as great, perhaps, as one expects. But it's interesting. Oh, yes, you're certain to find it interesting. And so it goes on. They became conscious here of the procession of dark trees into which, as far as they could see, Helen was now looking. And there are pleasures where one doesn't expect them. You must write to your father. And you'll be very happy, I've no doubt. But I must go to bed. And if you are sensible, you will follow in ten minutes. And so... She rose and stood before them, almost featureless and very large. Good night. She passed behind the curtain. After sitting in silence for the greater part of the ten minutes, she allowed them. They rose and hung over the rail. Beneath them, the smooth black water slipped away very fast and silently. The spark of a cigarette vanished behind them. A beautiful voice, Terence murmured. Rachel assented. Helen had a beautiful voice. After a silence, she asked, looking up into the sky, Are we on the deck of a steamer on a river in South America? Am I Rachel and you Terence? The great black world lay round them. As they were drawn smoothly along, it seemed possessed of immense thickness and endurance. They could discern pointed treetops and blunt rounded treetops. Raising their eyes above the trees, they fixed them on the stars and the pale border of sky above the trees. The little points of frosty light, infinitely far away, drew their eyes and held them fixed, so that it seemed as if they stayed a long time and fell a great distance when once more they realized their hands were grasping the rail and their separate bodies standing side by side. You'd forgotten completely about me, Terence reproached her, taking her arm and beginning to pace the deck, and I never forget you. Oh, no, she whispered. She had not forgotten, only the stars, the night, the dark, you're like a bird half asleep in its nest, Rachel. You're asleep. You're talking in your sleep. Half asleep, 
and murmuring broken words, they stood in the angle made by the bow of the boat. It slipped on down the river. Now a bell struck on the bridge, and they heard the lapping of water as it rippled away on either side. And once a bird, startled in its sleep, creaked, flew on to the next tree, and was silent again. The darkness poured down profusely, and left them with scarcely any feeling of life, except that they were standing there, together, in the darkness. End of chapter 21